why don't I hand it over to you? Wow. Yeah. Well, good morning, church. How are you? It's so good to be in the house of the Lord. I guess I'm here. <laughs> Anyways, well, we want to welcome all the first-time visitors. Thank you for coming and making, you know, um, time to come, especially today. We, we pay back the hour we got at the fall. So this is, this is the time that we give it back. <laughs> so I'm so glad you're here. So we welcome you, and, and we hope the Holy Spirit touches you and speaks to you and, and guides you and, and shows you what you need to do, you know, because it's, it's, to me, it's, it's a given that when people are looking, they're, they're, they're come to visit churches, is because they're looking. So we pray that the Holy Spirit guides you to the right place, because we all need to be at the right place. We need to be planted at the right place, so we can produce fruit, and we can be very um, um, a part of what the Lord is doing in the vision of the house. So I pray that the Holy Spirit guides you, and um, we just excited that you are here. So welcome, and this is a Holy Ghost church. What I love about this church is that the very first day, you know what we are about. You, you leave this place, you don't leave this place wondering. You know that we're Holy Ghost people. We believe in the full gospel. We allow the Holy Spirit to move here. We believe in miracles, signs, and wonders. We believe in getting the lost saved. So you are, if that's what you're looking for, you're at the right place. We're a really good place. Right, church? The rest of you, family? We're in a good place, good company. So welcome, welcome. And if you would like to, we have the ushers. They have a, a card that says thank you for coming today. And if you can give your information, um, uh, what this does is we will put you in the system. And we will uh, text you throughout the week and let you know the events and what's happening here. We normally try not to bother you guys a lot with the text, but we, we text you enough for you to know what's happening with the church. And so if you would like one, raise your hand and the ushers will give it to you, fill it up and put it in the offering bucket. Also, I wanted to invite you to come in. We have prayer meetings on Wednesday nights, but tonight we also have services at six o'clock. I jump a service six o'clock tonight. We have Holy Ghost meetings. Uh, this is the Sunday night format is just we flow with the Holy Spirit. It's more of a Holy Ghost uh, time and, and, and allow him to minister to people. Wednesday night is prayer. And then we have youth today. If you are from the ages 12 to 18, you feel free to come uh, here at 6 o'clock tonight. I have some, oh, there it is. River Student Ministries. That's what RSM, in case you were wondering stands for River Student Ministries and it's at six o'clock Sunday nights so um, I'm very excited because I have um, uh, we have the the I have all the ushers showing me different cards so I'm trying to figure out which one you want but I, I, I have it thank you guys thank you I have it don't distract me squirrel <laughs> like, uh, anyways so um, we have our outreach coming. How many of you guys are excited about outreach? We have it. Um, uh, we have, uh, it's going to be here on the property and it's going to be April 16th. It's the Saturday before Easter. And what we're going to do is we're going to do a format similar to what we did for Harvest Fest and what we do outreach in the park. So we're going to combine the, that two of them, but it's going to be here on the property. So we're going to be giving over 10000 candy fill eggs in the property and we're going to be giving away tvs you know that's what we do we're going to be uh we're going to give away a nintendo switch and um so you're probably wondering why are we doing this do we celebrate easter we do not celebrate easter the pagan way we celebrate the the death and resurrection of our lord jesus and you probably wonder well then why do we do the eggs Bunnies don't give eggs. I know that. But what we do here at the river, we use any bait to get the lost to come. So this is what we do. We invite the community to come and to be a part. And how many of you guys know that if you have bait, people will come? How many of you guys go fishing without bait? 
Do you expect to get anything? No. So we're fishers of men, so we have to have bait, right? So this is our bait, the 10,000 candy filled eggs. We want the families to come, the TVs, and the Nintendo Switch, so we can preach the gospel to them. So we not only bless them, but we preach the gospel to them and we give them the opportunity. So that day, we're going to need to have all hands on deck, church. So if you want to be a part of it, you know, we're going to have a signed up uh, sheet on the back or come and see uh, Eric and Candace, which right now they're uh, out of town, but they're coming back here next Sunday. So just come and talk to us, get involved. Um, if you want to bring some eggs, bring them. You want to sew? So financially, so we can get the TVs and the other stuff, and it's going to be all for the lost. This is, this is all for the lost, for the outreach. Let me just quickly jump in here. Um, how many of you have been part of uh, one of our outreaches? Okay. For those of you who have never been involved in um, these outreaches, um, we have seen great success. Um, the first one we've done was in Centerton. Um, it was a... Uh, well, it was the first one was in 2000, December 2020, right? When did we start the church? <laughs> um, so, but, but we, uh, we had about, how many people came? We had about 300. Elders. Just over three. Our first outreach had like 300 people come. And they were in line. They lined up. I mean, there was a long line. And they, they sat there and they listened to the gospel. And many, many I think 60 people came forward to receive Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And so that's what it's all about. It's all about souls. Everybody say souls. And uh, th then we did one over in um, um, Rogers downtown. Rogers, and we, we had some persecution there. They tried to shut us down, but it was too late. We, we did two in Rogers, yeah. Well, two in Centerton and one in Rogers. They tried to shut us down, but it was like the devil's always late, you know, one step behind. And the, we already won the souls. We already gave away all the stuff. So um, it was just somebody didn't like Jesus, you know, uh, because we were legally there. Um, it was okay. But, you know, you get people that don't like the move of God and they try to shut things down. And, um, and then recently we had, we had the, the news, ABC came, KNWA. Is that a, I'm still learning. So they came and then did an interview with us. And so, so the, the word's getting out and we had a huge turnout here at Harvest Fest. Um, so I believe this thing is creating momentum. We're getting our name out there in the community. And people know one thing for sure is that this is a giving church. And they, they, we, we're not just handing tracts out, but we're actually blessing the community. And we're sowing our time and we're preaching the gospel. Amen. It's not about filling a church. It's about preaching the gospel. Because if we just have this, you know, big event and Easter eggs and we don't preach the gospel, we just invite people to come to church. What are we doing? Right? So we, it's all about souls. It's about populating heaven and plundering hell, period. Amen? And if we get people coming to the church out of that, great. If we don't, hey, praise God, we're preaching the gospel. Amen? So that's what it's all about. Absolutely. That's what it is. We're being obedient to his word. Amen? And then I have a second thing that we're doing. Ladies, how many ladies are out there? Oh, you guys are too quiet. Let me hear a little. Woo! Woo! Uh, let, let, me, let me do it again. How many ladies are out there? Yeah. Woohoo! Okay, so repeat after me. April 5th. April 5th. It's a Tuesday. Tuesday. You don't have to repeat that, the rest of what I'm going to say. <laughs> Thank you, Pastor Steve, even though I was asking the ladies to repeat. <laughs> Anyways, so we're going to go uh, to uh, uh, um, Pottery... Uh, studio and we're going to be painting pottery or you can do like a little door knocker which is like a big thing like you can see there um in in there is like a little piggy like that's for the racer bags or whatever they have so we're going to have a time of fellowship we're going to have uh paint did i say something wrong oh anyways the racer bags well i'm i'm still getting into that racer bag thing um anyways so <laughs> Sorry, I'm not into football. I'm a Mexican girl. So we, anyways, let me move on before I dig the hole bigger. Anyhow, so we're going to have an awesome time of fellowship and painting together. So how many of you guys would like to come have a time of fellowship? This is for Flourish. This year, this, this time in April, that's what we're going to do. We're going to have a time of fun and fellowship, 
painting crafts together and just having a good old time because the guys went bowling and they had biscuits or whatever they had the other day and I thought and and I thought you know what let's have some fun with the girls so it's gonna be April 5th at 6 p.m. at the studio here in Rogers It's very close by here so we have a little sign up sheet on the back come and talk to Jennifer and she'll be on the back and um, and you can sign up your name. We do need you. Uh, need, we need you to RSVP, and that way you can see the prices and see what you would like to do. And then from there we go. So that is all. So we're just very excited about this. And then that's right, April. Uh, Easter, April 19, we're going to have Keith Willer. He's going to be here, and he's going to be doing Resurrection Sunday. Uh, Keith Willer, he's one of our mentors. When we went to Bible College, he was our director. And, um, and this man is, I never seen somebody that represents Jesus, I mean, so well. He, he just oozes the love of Jesus. He has walked around the world, and... He's in Paraguay carrying the cross, and what he does, he carries the cross, and he preaches uh, Jesus one-on-one, -on -one, and he has been beaten, he has been in prison, he has been in, well, more in jail, not in prison. Um, yeah, all of that. So, anyway, so... <laughs> okay, okay. Okay, let me take him. So, so Keith, Keith uh, he has... Uh, first of all, it's a real honor to have him come on Easter Sunday. Please get the word out. Um, when my wife and I met, he was our director. And uh, so we have a special place in our heart for him. But one of the things I really like my wife was saying is that he, he's, he loves, uh, he's always got a smile on his face. That smile that you see is always on his face. And he just, he just shares Jesus everywhere he goes. He carries a 90-pound wooden cross. Um, there was another man, Arthur Blessed, you heard of him, so those of you people who have been around a little longer, uh, you heard of him, but uh, he's probably next in line, that was kind of his, his guy he kind of looked up to and kind of patterned his ministry after him. He's uh, literally walked, uh, if you add all the, all the miles up, he would have walked the entire circumference of the, the globe. He's been to over 220 nations, basically every nation in the, in the, in the world, um, and just walks and, and carries across. And he's had, he's had guns pointed at him. He's had one time he was, uh, he was preaching, and, and uh, they, they, they were about ready to shoot him. And then they, 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 they looked and start terror, and they said, the light, the light is so bright, and they ran away because, obviously, it was, it was at night, and there was an angel that was there and protecting him. And, um, but uh, you will be so blessed if uh, you come to this. Um, and again, it's a, it's a real treat for us because we, we, we love him very dearly. And uh, my son, we met him for the first time. He said, man, I've never seen somebody that's so wholesome that just loves God so much. You know, he just loves to be around him. So you're going to be blessed. So everybody make plans to be here for Easter and, of course, the outreach. But... Um, um, so, any, any questions? <laughs> That's pretty much it, right? Am I doing the rest of the announcements? Is that it? Okay. Well, why don't you welcome um, Pastor Judy as, as she comes, and, and Steve, Pastor Steve. Are the two of you coming? or? Oh, you're, okay. Okay. Why don't you con come up and share on stewardship before we start on the main message. Praise God. This is the main message right now, so pay attention. I would rather that you guys cry rather than snore, just like Pastor Dale said. So, all right. What I'm going to share with you today is um, that God has a standard. Oh, thank you, my love. That's very sweet. All right. Um, that God has a standard and... I'm sorry, you know what? I didn't even greet you. Good morning, church family. I cannot see you with these glasses. I can only see this. But I'm glad that you're here. All right. You want me to hold it? It's better? Okay. All right. Thank you, my love. All right. Um, John 3.16, if you would put that up in the Amplified for me, please. 
this really touched me. I mean, it just changed my whole perspective on this. Um, because it says that God so greatly loved and dearly prized the world that he even gave up his only begotten son so that whoever believes and trusts in him, clings to him, shall not perish but come not to destruction but have eternal everlasting life. And if you, as you read the Bible, you will discover that the Bible has standards. It has the principle. So it is the standard. But it's also pieces that you put together. And you think, well, what does this have to do with giving? It says that God so greatly loved and he prized the world, the stinky, messy world. And he gave us Jesus. He loved and he gave. Matthew 6.21 says, where your treasure is, there is your heart. Where is God's heart? Where is his treasure? We are. Where is heart? Where is treasure? But so is Jesus, because he gave the very, very best to have us as his treasure. And that just really touched me because it was more emphasis on the love and then what you do with that love, you give. All right. If you um, go to Luke 6, 36, through eight, there are some foundations, some structure. There's a pattern here that we are to follow, that the Lord says, be merciful, I'm mercy. Don't judge, I won't judge. Don't condemn, I won't condemn. Forgive, I will forgive. And all of these are patterns, all of these are characteristics but they're all part of God's giving nature. That is part of his standard, what he has established for us to follow. So when he does that and he lays those foundational principles, the next verse says, give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, shall men give into your bosom. For with the same measure that you meet with all, it will be measured to you again. The interesting thing that I discovered when I was praying and and really asking the Lord, what am I to say? Was number one, God didn't say how much to give. He gave a command and he said, give. Then the next word, words, are all adjectives. They're all descript, descriptions. He says, it, very small word, I-T, it, shall be given unto you. And he describes how he will do it. He will do it with good measure, pressed down, shaken together. If you've ever made gravy or, or anything, you've put stuff, you know, flour in a jar and you shake it up and boom, it um, bubbles over. That's how I kind of look at it. It's like gravy from this on end when we have Jesus. Um, men, he says, will give into your bosom. But here's the, here's the stickler. For with the same measure that you give, it'll be given unto you. 
The measure is God's standard. And his standard is Jesus. His standard was that he loved. His standard was that he prized us so much that we are such a treasure to him. He gave up his treasure for us to accept or reject. And so it isn't so much like how much you give. God never tells you how much to give in here. It's a command. We belong to him. He has set the standard. He gave us Jesus and you cannot, there's nothing above him. Nothing. But he expects us to give in the same standard that he gave. And that is with love. We are not to be stingy or cheap. And I'm not saying anybody in here is. I'm just saying it, it changed my focus. It is really, if you stop and think about it, it is a treasure. It is an honor to give back to someone who's already given us the highest, the most. And all he tells us is to give, but give with the same standard. That's how, that's how I, I had a hard time with that because I didn't, I didn't understand it. I even called Pastor Lucy and we, we prayed and, we, and, and the Lord showed us. I have a standard, the Lord says. And I expect you to follow that standard. And that standard is his word. It's Jesus. That is what we live by. But all of the principles before in 636 and 637, he's laying those down. And then it becomes an act when you give. It requires something of us. It's not just a mental, oh, uh, mental um, desire. It is not a prayer. It is an actual act. It takes something from you because it took something from God. It took a human being. It took his blood and everything that he went through because we were his treasure. So I just say when you give, number one, it's an honor to be able to give, to give back to him. But think of the standard that God set for us and that if we want to be blessed I mean he gives one he tells us one word and then he gives us this whole other stuff that he says that he will do back for us again he's even he always gives more and just remember when you give we are his treasure And his treasure should honor and give back to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's what I. That was powerful. Thank you, sir. Very powerful. One thing I have to say about Pastor Steve and Judy is that they live what they preach. And you can tell that it came from her heart because giving, it's a heart thing. If you're trying to figure out ways of how to get around that, you missed it. Because where your treasure is, that's where your heart, because that's so true. His standard was his best. God's standard is his best. He gave us his best. And only what all God asks for in return is our best. We give God our best. He gives us his best. 
who do you think got the shorter end of the stick here? <laughs> But God doesn't get the short end to him. I mean, you're so precious to him. You have to understand. And everything you, he wants our hearts. That's the bottom line. Amen. And you do, you do what the Lord tells you. And of course, you know, um, you know, we're obviously the very faithful tithers here and givers and, and just do what the Lord asks of you today. Amen. He doesn't want you to break the bank, but then there's times where the, you know, there's the alabaster box, you know, um, some people give an alabaster box, and, and it's a, it's, many times it's a time of breakthrough. We gave our alabaster box before, and it was, it was scary, you know, but it's not something that you do every single day. Um, but there's, there's times, you just do what the Lord says, and it takes the pressure off, amen? Because when you do what he says, then there's a blessing in, in return, and we can trust him. How many trust the Lord this morning? Amen. Let's go ahead and put, put up uh, the ways to give this morning. If you need an offering envelope, um, the uh, ushers will, will uh, get that to you. And then there's different ways you can give up there on the screen. If I can get a couple, couple ushers to, uh, while they're multitasking, can I get a couple guys to put this up here quickly? Here, let me put this in here. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. Anybody? Need an offering envelope? Just raise your hand. If you're making your checks out, make it out to the river. We believe this is good ground because we're after souls. We're after the move of God. And we want to see not just this little neighborhood shaken, but we want to see the whole of northwest Arkansas shaken by the power of God. And uh, we want to get the gospel out. We want to win souls and plunder hell, populate heaven. Amen. And uh, we have a lot of plans here. Uh, as you could see over here on the side, we've been working on the playground. We're going to add to that. Uh, we just fenced it in. We're going to put some other things in there for the kids. And, um, and then there's things we're going to do in the nursery. And um, so we, we keep, you know, we, we just went shopping actually this last week and got a bunch of stuff. So you're going to be, we're going to be putting some lights up here. So just know we're a work in progress. I think the Lord's done a lot since we started here. If you saw this place um, you know, but you know what? You can have a beautiful place. You can have a beautiful building. But if you're not preaching the gospel, what are you doing? Amen. And uh, so we want to be effective. Everybody say effective. We want to be effective for the kingdom. Praise God. Anybody need some more time? All right. Well, let's pray. Father, just grab your offering in your hand, uh, whether it be your cell phone or, or your a check or envelope. Just put it in your hand as a point of contact. Father, I thank you. I just put mine in the offering bucket. I'll reach out to my offering. Father, right now in the name of Jesus, I thank you for every seed that's sown and, the, and the, everyone that is sowing seed this morning. Lord, we, we do this as an act of worship. Lord, we worship you just like you gave of yourself. You gave your very best. Lord, we give our best this morning. We sow into your kingdom and we say thank you, Lord. This is the least we can do. Uh, to say thank you. And Lord, I thank you that we're in covenant with you. If you're a tither here this morning, you're in covenant with God. If you're a giver, you are in covenant with him. And so Lord, we thank you that uh, you said in your word that you would rebuke the devourer for our sake. And so, Lord, we thank you that uh, the, the enemy has been rebuked, the devourer has been rebuked, and I thank you, Lord, that you bless every person here, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over shall men give under their bosoms. I thank you for 30, 60, and a hundredfold return. And, Lord, I thank you, you are their provider. And so this is proof this morning that we trust you in our tithes and our offerings. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, amen. 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 Give with a glad heart this morning. Amen. God loves a cheerful giver whose heart is in his giving amen praise god hallelujah well are you happy as uh my wife was kind of you know the holy spirit was moving you know sometimes people say oh the holy spirit can only move at the end of the service but we say lord come and move if you want to move during the announcements you can move during the announcement i don't care you can do whatever you want to do and um so she was getting touched, and I called her up, and I didn't realize how woozy she was. She was getting touched by the Spirit of God, so she was kind of like kind of stepping out of that, uh, that mode and <laughs> ready to do announcements. So, uh, but she, I, think she's, uh, I think you're good now. Not that you were bad, because it's nothing like, I mean, you, how many know when you get touched by the power of God, when, I mean, he overwhelms you, it's just like you don't want to step out of it. 
And uh, she's saying, you're digging a hole. No, it's a good thing. But you have to function too. What good would it be if I'm laying out on the floor and I've got to preach? Um, that, then you just have the Holy Spirit just, yeah, we have a slumber party. <laughs> Hallelujah. Praise God. Lord, we thank you for your word. And I thank you for revelation knowledge for every person here this morning. And I thank you, Lord, that not one person will leave this place the same way they came. I pray, Lord, that you would use my tongue and Lord, I will speak your words, and Lord, teach us through your word this morning. We receive the word of the Lord by faith, and we thank you, Lord, that we will leave this place changed with our eyes more open and our ears more open. And so, Lord, I thank you. You're changing us from the inside out through your spirit and through your word in Jesus' name. And everybody said... Amen. Hallelujah. Well, we have been on the subject of the fearless church. How many were here last Sunday? We talked about the fearless church. How many here would love to just live a life that's carefree, a fearless life? You ever seen that, that uh, no fear sticker? Anybody seen that no fear sticker? Um, and then the Christians got a hold of, fear not. You know, <laughs> They try to make their Christianese version. But we're, we're called to live a life of of boldness, uh, we are called to occupy till he comes. We're not called to sit back behind our computer screen and watch all the fake news and, and just store up for a rainy day and, and, and not be effective. Amen. How many know that the enemy would love to push you in a corner and keep you ineffective? Just, just shut up, put your mask on, do what you're told, comply. And don't do anything for Jesus. Just sit, watch the news, and just sit there. And How about if you just pray? Just pray. And not that I, I think we, we have to pray. But the Bible says the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man and of a righteous man availeth much. The effect, how many know that there's effect, effectual prayers and then there's ineffectual prayers? What's an ineffectual prayer? Lord, um... I guess if you really want to, you know, just pray whatever your will is, you know, whatever, just figure it out, you know. That's not an effective prayer. An effective prayer is finding out what the Bible says, find out what the will of God is, because faith begins where? Where the will of God is known. So if you don't know what the word of God says concerning a thing, how in the world are you going to believe God when you pray, how in the world are you going to pray in faith? Amen? So we want to pray. That's important. We have prayer nights on Wednesdays, and we should be praying in our own personal prayer closet and throughout the day. We should all have a personal prayer life. But some people, all they do is pray. They don't do anything else but sit back and pray. And that's important. But understand that God has called you to do, Right? He's called you to step out and to do things for the kingdom of God, to be effective. Amen. The prayer is important. Wednesday night prayer. We pray in the Holy Ghost, man. We, we have a few different people, you know, that we assign that we feel led to, to give the microphone to. We pray in the Holy Spirit. We pray in the understanding because we believe the reason we're here today is because we obeyed God and we prayed. So there's, very, there's a high importance of prayer. We're going to talk about prayer later on in the year, um, and, you know, how to pray effectively. Um, but there is more to our Christian walk than just sitting back and praying. Oh, let's pray. Just pray for, you know, people, people, people post things on Facebook. Uh, not, not that I think it's bad, but, you know, pray for Ukraine. Yeah, yeah. Pray, yeah, pray for, pray for Ukraine. Yes. But are, let me ask a question. Is that person that posted that, are they actually praying? But it's just a post. Oh, look at me. I'm spiritual. P pray for you. Now, if you're saying that, great. But be pr praying for Ukraine yourself, too. Uh, you know, but we get all spiritual. We get all, you know, you know, just do this, do this, pray, you know, post, post, post. And meanwhile, what are we doing ourselves that's being effective for the kingdom of God? Yeah, there's too many people in the church today that are just church you know, pew warmers and just watching, you know, we've created this culture 
in the church, in the modern day church, where we sit down, watch, eat our popcorn, drink our Starbucks, watch the preacher, let's see how good his message is. Oh man, that was a great message. What did you preach about? I don't know, but he's just really cool. He really is a good communicator. You know, oh wow, did you see it? the illustrations were really cool. And we don't forget, we don't remember, it was just a really encouraging and, and motivating and ah, I can't wait till next Sunday. Meanwhile, people are doing nothing. They're sitting in their seats and they're feeling good about themselves because they checked the church box on Sunday, and they're part of the club. You know, they got the t-shirt, they got the hat, they got all the little paraphernalia that shows this is my identity. I go to the, you know, I love my church. I love my church too. And we might get bumper stickers. I don't know, maybe one day I might be, you know, eating my words right now. But but you have to understand that people get their identity in, in, in branding and all these things, but they're sitting and doing nothing while the world is going to hell in a handbasket and we're just sitting there, feed me, feed me. Uh, I need to learn more. I need more revelation. I need more revelation. And meanwhile, the devil's having them for breakfast. Like the late Dr. Norval Hayes would say, the devil has most Christians for breakfast. And I'll get, in that in a, get there in a second. But we're talking about the life of a fearless, faith-filled life is what God has called every believer. Everybody say, every believer. That's including me. Say that. That's including me. Turn to your neighbor and say, that's including you. Turn to your other neighbor and say, that's including you. Now quickly turn around to the back of you and say, that's including you. They're not looking at you because they're looking back to the person behind you. I learned that trick from... My pastor, he does that. That's funny. Anyway, <laughs> turn in your Bibles to Hebrews chapter 10. How many love the Word of God? I'm going to recap a little bit on, on um, kind of fast forward to a couple of verses here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. It says, now the just shall live by faith. How many just people are here? If you're saved, if you're born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, you are the righteousness of God in Christ. You are made just. Holiness is separation unto God. That's, that's uh, dedicating your life to the Lord and, and living a life that's consecrated to God. But righteousness, being in right standing with him, uh, that, that comes by just being washed in the blood of Jesus, being saved. So you're in right standing with, with God. But you have, uh, sorry, verse uh, 38. Now the just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back... Uh, the Amplified says, uh, shrink back or uh, put up the Amplified. Shrink back or, uh, or in fear. What does the Amplified say? I don't have it written down. But the just shall live by faith. My righteous servant shall live by his conviction respecting man's relationship to God and divine things in holy fervor, born of faith and conjoined with it. And if he draws back and shrinks in fear, and if he draws back and shrinks in fear, I'll say that again. And if he draws back and shrinks in fear, my soul has oh, my soul has no delight or pleasure in him. Verse 39. But our way is not of those who draw back to eternal misery, perdition, and are utterly destroyed. But we are of those who believe, who cleave to and trust in and rely on God through Jesus Christ the Messiah in faith, by faith preserve the soul. So everybody say this after me. I am not drawing back. I'm moving forward. The enemy wants to keep the church marginalized. Step aside. Do your little church club thing. Don't be effective. Just sit there, shut up, keep your, keep your little club going, and, and don't grow. And as long as, you know, the tithes and offerings are coming, you're good. No. We're going to take ground. We're going to go after the devil's kingdom. And we're going to plunder hell and populate heaven. We're going to be effective for his kingdom. Amen. There's, there's coming. We are in, living in a time in these last. How many know we're in the last days? We're going to get into that subject after Easter, okay, just so you know. But we're in the last days, and now is the time for the church to rise up and be the church. Stop cowering back, drawing back. Uh, 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 squirming, or what, what's the word? Um, shriveling, or uh, what, what's verse 38 say in the Amplified? Shrink back. We're not going to shrink back. On the contrary, we're going to run. We have a race to run. Amen. We got a race to run. Let me take this off. I forgot I got this thing on. Multitasking here. We got to turn to your neighbor and say, You got a race to run while I'm taking this off. <laughs> 
We've got a race to run, amen. And you can't run a race if you're cowering back, if you're sitting back in fear. I don't see anybody running a race effectively that's in fear. Oh, I might lose. You know, I might trip. I, a friend of mine ran a race, and, you know, he tripped and, you know, skiffed, scuffed his knee and broke his ankle. So I, I think I'll just sit back. It, it's safer this way. Get out of your comfort zone and start running your race for God. Amen. So fear draws back, it paralyzes, and it keeps people ineffective. Ineffective. Romans 12, 3 says that we've all been given a measure of faith, right? We all, all of us have faith. We all have faith, right? We all have, everybody say, I have faith. If you're born again, God's given you, even before you were born again, he's given you a measure of faith to be able to receive Christ as your Lord and Savior. So we all have a measure of faith, but God doesn't require us to have faith because he already gave that faith to us. He's requiring us to live by faith. It's one thing to have faith. Oh, I have lots of faith. I believe in God. Yeah, but are you living by faith? Big difference. Faith without what is dead? Faith without works is dead. You can't live by faith sitting in your mom and dad's basement playing video games or binging on fake news. I used to binge on news. I'm, I'm so tired of it, you know. There's this certain programs I'd just watch. Every, without fail, I'd watch boom, boom, these are the personalities. And I finally just said, done. This is, I'm not, I'm not being effective, right? I'm not being, nothing's happening. I'm not changing anything. I'm just hearing more garbage. And nowadays, you don't even know which news channel to, to, to trust. So I'd, I'd rather spend more time in the Word. Get the headlines and... Ask the Holy Spirit to help you weed out the, the fake stuff and, um, and pray. Because what you see on the news isn't, everything's not as, out, as it seems, you understand. Because there's a narrative, and I won't even get into politics right now, but there's a narrative that not just our current administration wants you to know or believe, but there's, there's a lot of propaganda happening around the world. There's a, there's a bigger plan, there's a big, and it's all heading towards a one world government uh, you know, so, so we won't go there right now, but there is a narrative. There's propaganda. God, God wants you to get your eyes off the propaganda and get your eyes in the word because how many know that there's a, there's a big distraction? The enemy wants to distract you, get you in fear, distract you so that you're ineffective. And then you live another year. You know, we've been in COVID for how long? Two years? Two years now, huh? when's it going to end? Oh, okay, they're taking the mask off. How do we know they're not going to come up with another variant they're going to shoot out at us? How do we know they're not going to lock down? They're just, they're just, you know, they've got so many plans. When are we going to stop and go, you know what? I'm not going to let another two years go by. I'm, I'm going to rise up and be who God called me to be. Kick butt and take names for Jesus. <laughs> Kick the devil's butt is what we're talking about. Amen? Glory to God. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of what? Power, love, and a sound mind. Power, love, and a sound mind. Spirit, uh, fear is a spirit. You have to understand that, that the devil tries to paralyze you with fear, and if he can paralyze you, he keeps you ineffective. But God hasn't given us that. He's given us a spirit of power and of love and of a sound mind. A life lived by faith is a life lived without fear. A life lived by faith is a life lived without fear. You look at the early church. You study the, these were fearless people. Look at Stephen, man. He got stoned. He just stood there. He didn't, he didn't give up. He didn't buckle. And, and he just looked up, the glory of God was upon him. He looked like an angel because they're walking in the supernatural. The church, what makes us think that the church in the latter days, in the last days, is going gonna, is gonna to be e any less effective than the early church? That was the, the early church was, a, was the pattern, right? We're talking about patterns and principles that God puts in his word. Jesus said, tearing the city of Jerusalem until you endue with power from on high. 
Don't do anything. You guys are well equipped. I trained you for three and a half years. You've been my disciples. You know how to do ministry. I even gave you authority to cast out devils. But wait, you're not ready. You have to get and do with power from us. So the pattern is in Acts. But yet you look at the modern day church. There's no book of Acts. There are, you know. That's what we want to be, and that's what I believe we are doing, and we're learning and we're growing because that's what we're pursuing is the book of Acts church that Jesus made the blueprint for, right? So how many know the way Jesus starts something is the way we're supposed to continue, right? Oh, we don't have the, we don't, we just have the word, you know. We just have, we don't need, we don't need all that. Okay, there's, how many, is it eight and a half billion people on the earth today? I don't know what the latest figure is. I don't know what the population was in those times, but I promise you it was less than a billion, probably a hundred million. I, I don't know what, you know, but if God thought it was important for that generation to have the power of God, the fire of God, miracle signs and wonders, for that population, how much more does God want to touch an, uh, billions and billions of people that he created that has never experienced God. You think doctrine is gonna save the world? You think your, your denominational doctrine is gonna make the world come running to your church? Oh, oh, it's because we have cool music or we have our, our, our preacher, man, he, he's, he's really relevant. If you're relevant and you have no power, the world's not interested. Period. They're, they're looking for something real. And that's why they're not in church. Because they're not, they've seen, they say, well, what are you guys about? I don't see God here. I have more, I, I see God more on the beach, you know. We need to rise up. The church has to be the church. Amen. So this living fearless life, living a life full of the Holy Ghost, living a life full of power, full of love, sound mind. This is the kind of, God's raising us up to be warriors for him. To not just sit back and just be float in and, and just blend in. He's called us to stick out, right? Go upstream. People talk about mainstream. We're not about mainstream. We're about upstream where the source is. What's everybody else doing? What are the churches doing? How are they growing? How do we fill the, ch you know, church growth seminars? Mainstream. I'm not interested in mainstream. I'm about the stream that comes from the throne of God, the river of God. That's the stream I'm looking for, and I don't care if it's the most unpopular thing in the church world because I got better things to do than to try to blend in with mainstream Christianity. It's all about being effective. Everybody say effective. Oh, you know, now this is all pie in the sky. I'm just reading the Bible. Do we believe this or we do, do we not believe it? If it's in the Bible, I believe it. Amen. Life lived without fear. It's very important if we want our lives to be effective for the kingdom of God. If we're going to live a fearless, effective life of faith, who here wants your life to be effective? That's the first question. You want your life to be effective. Don't everybody raise your hand at the same time. I mean, ra raise it like you mean it. If you really want your life to be effective, raise your hand. Come on. Then we can start there. Lift our hand. Because if you can't lift your hand, how in the world are you going to be able to do what God's called you to do? I mean, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm not picking on any one person. I'm just saying three people raise their hand. I'm going, what, what in the world? <laughs> Try to respond. If we can't respond in a church service like this, how in the world are we going to respond to God when he tells us to do something? Wake up. <laughs> I do this with all the love in my heart. You all know me. I'm a pastor. I love people. I hurt when people are hurting. But sometimes I've got to blow the cobwebs out. And we don't like cobwebs. We don't like wasps. You all know that one day I got stung by a wasp when I opened my Bible. I'm like, you stinking devil? Who do you think you are? And I'm not looking for devils behind every corner, and there's people that do that. Well, I saw a devil. You know, but I know when the devil's trying to distract and, and, and interrogate and, and uh, you know, be a hindrance. And sometimes he comes to do that. But we want our lives to be effective. We want it to matter. We want our lives to count for eternity. Amen? We got... If, you know, if we're blessed with long life, let's say 100 years. Okay, 120 years. 
We got 100, let's say we have 120 years. 120 years to make your mark for eternity. Half our life is gone. Okay. Now we have the rest of our life to make our mark for eternity. So should we just continue on and just float and watch Christian television all day and just get fat, full of doctrine and teaching and do nothing and feel so spiritual, but yet we're not doing anything for the kingdom of God? Absolutely not. We're going to be effective. There's a lot of ineffective Christians in the church today. A lot of ineffective Christians. Hearts are right. Hearts are right. Some of them have a lot of zeal. They have a lot of uh, passion, uh, even boldness. But think about this. It, you could be fearless. You could be a fearless Christian. It's just like a, it's like a, a fearless soldier that goes into battle, and he's got his battle axe with him. He's fearless. He's like, come on. He's not sitting back. He's, he's you know, he, he's, he's not watching things from a distance. He's leading from the front, and he's got his battle wax with him, and then he realizes that the... Uh, the enemy is equipped with machine guns. Okay, so his ignorance got him killed. So we can have fear, be fearless. We can be full of faith. We can have all this thing, rah, rah, rah. I'm going to serve God, man. I'm going to get passionate. I'm on the fire of God, amen. And we fall flat on our face because we didn't know our enemy. You with me? We don't want to be a fearless idiot. <laughs> Uh, I don't know which is better to be, uh, you know, a timid, wise person or a fearless, ignorant person. I think both are, are not good. We want to be fearless, wise person. Amen. Many Christians have a, have a heart for God, but because they're ignorance, they're losing battles left and right. They love God, they follow God, they go to church. They're passionate for God, but they're losing battles. And some of those battles they're losing, they don't even know they're losing. They're just like, well, this is my lot, this is, what, this is life, this is the way life is. You know, you win some, you lose some. You know, there's a devil out there. And blame, blaming the devil on everything. Oh, it's a, you know, they blow up the devil like he's, like he's omnipresent, like, he, like he's equal with God. You know, it's easy to not take responsibility when you blame you know, well, this is the way it is. You know, the devil's attacking me. And, you know, the devil only has the power you give him. And this is where the church, I think, a lot of the church anyway, I say the church, I say as a whole, has kind of missed it. Like I said, Dr. Norval Hayes, he said the devil has most Christians for breakfast. Why is that? Why, is, why does the devil toy around with most Christians? It's because of ignorance. It's because of ignorance. Hosea 4, 6 says, My people perish for a lack of knowledge. My people. Who's my people? God's people. You're God's people. So, in other words, God's people that he loves very much, they're perishing because of lack of knowledge. Yes, it's called ignorance. So you can love God with all your heart and be ignorant and keep falling on your face. Always living from battle to battle to battle and never winning. Wondering what's going on with my life. But because you're ill-equipped, you went out into the battle with your battle axe and there's machine guns out there. We're not in the Middle Ages, folks. We're, we're in a different time. <laughs> Amen. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil... As a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Okay, we're going to talk about this for a minute. Who is he seeking? Who is the devil seeking? Every, he's seeking everybody, right? What, why, is he, why is he seeking people to devour? Why doesn't he just devour everybody? If he hates everybody, why doesn't he just devour everybody? Let's read that again. Where, be sober, be vigilant, be 
because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may, who he may devour. What is that saying? He may devour. That means he doesn't have permission to devour certain people. May is a word of permission. You with me? It means he can't devour certain people. He can try to attack. He can try to stick his ugly tail or his horns or his pitchfork, whatever you want to. I don't know if he has a pitchfork or not. I don't really care. <laughs> but he's, So there's some people he can't devour, and there's some that he may devour. Why does he have permission for some and not for others? That is the question. Many people don't know their authority. They don't understand their God-given authority. So I want to talk about what we're going to talk about here today, and we're just going to kind of get into a little bit of an introduction today, okay? But for the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about our authority as believers. Amen. Because for us to live fearlessly, we have to understand that there's a devil out there that's not going to try to give you a run up the side. Oh, sure. Right this way. Oh, you want to, you want to win souls? Oh, you want to be effective? Right here. Can I give you a cup of coffee? Do you like cream and sugar with your coffee? What kind of coffee? You like onyx coffee? I'll get you that. Now, he's not going to just let you come in and do whatever you want to do. There's going to be resistance. There's a devil that hates your soul. But if you don't understand authority, you can go fearless and all of a sudden you hit the, see the devil and you don't know your authority and you're like, uh, and you run away. My son does that really good. <laughs> he's got this little nerdy way of doing it. He's funny. Picking on him. If we're going to live fearless, effective life of faith, we need to know our authority. Understand there's a battle going on between the devil and and God, there's a battle going on between light and darkness. But the problem is, is most people think that God and the devil are equal. Yes, there is a battle. There is a battle for the souls of men between God and the devil, right? There's a battle. There's a battle between light and darkness. But let me ask you a question. If it's pitch black in the natural, if it's pitch black in a room and you turn on a light, do you have to war in the heavenlies for that light to go? I mean, for that darkness to go. Do you have to wave flags? Do you have to do anything? I mean, do you have to blow a shofar? I mean, I'm not picking on them. I'm just saying some people pick up these ideas that, that I have to do all these things. If you turn on the stinking light, the darkness goes. But see, people don't understand. They think that they can go into a light room and turn on a darkness light and make the light go away. That's absolutely impossible because darkness is the absence of light. It's not equal to the light. It's like a vacuum. The light is the power and the darkness is this emptiness. But yet we look at, you know, yin yang. You ever see that yin yang thing? It's like good and evil, kind of like intertwined. It's like balance, everything's balanced between. No, there's no balance. <laughs> When God shows up, it's over, man. And the only reason why the devil has any authority on this land is because Adam handed that authority over to him when he sinned in the garden. And we'll, we're not going to get deep into that. But, but that, that, and he only has the authority you give him. Yes, he has some power. He has, he has, he is someplace. He's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere, okay? He does have some power. And if you don't have the Holy Ghost, and if you don't know your word, and if you don't know the Bible, if you don't, or you, you don't know scripture that can come against the devil, and you don't know the name of Jesus, you don't know your authority, he's going to have you for breakfast and lunch and dinner. And sometimes you won't even know it. You're just going to continue in life and wonder what's going on. Oh, I guess it's blame it on COVID. Blame it on Biden. Whatever. Everybody's blaming Biden. Listen, the problems we're just facing today is more than Biden. <laughs> we're putting too much power in that, that man sometimes he doesn't know where he's at um, 
Thanks, Biden. I know. I want to get too political. Uh, but you kind of know where I stand. <laughs> You can't compare the two. In many instances, the church has blown the devil way out of proportion. Where, and then the, what they've done, they've blown the devil up like he's this all-powerful, like Darth Vader. Or like, what's the, what's the guy that's above Darth Vader? That, uh, I don't know, Star Wars, you Star Wars geeks know what I'm talking about? Palpatine, okay, thank you. There's always one in the room. How's Palpatine? You didn't know that? <laughs> It's like the, you know, the dark side's greater than the, you know. But people see, that's all fictional, but people look at God that way. They look at the, like, you know, even in the movies we see, like, the, everybody thinks that the dark, so that's cool, man. You know, like, he's got more power than, than the weak, you know, goody two-shoes people. That's just, that's opposite. That's opposite of what the truth is. We've got all power over the enemy. Amen. But we have to know this. But if we have a question mark, if you live through life with a constant question mark and you don't know who you are in Christ, you don't know your authority, the devil's going to have you for breakfast. They shrunk the devil to the level, or they shrunk God, rather. They shrunk God to the level of the devil. So it's like they look at God and the devil like they're in this big heavyweight bout, right? They're just wrestling. There's, there's no, there's no, there's, it's two different realms. I mean, it's, the, the, the devil is a created being. You know, he was Lucifer, right? God created, God has been around for, he, he is, he created creation. The devil is a worm. I mean, he's a, he's a, a nothing. He has power for a season, Okay. And he will have his way with people that are not submitted to God. Yes. But compared to God, are you kidding me? I mean, it's like an ant, like, like a dead ant. There's, there's, there's no, there is no competition. God is only allowing the devil, because the Bible says that he's the, he's the God of this world, right? The devil, he's the God of this world, right? But he's only the God of this world because Adam handed over the keys to him. He said, okay, I'm going to let you have authority over. Adam was the one that was supposed to have authority over, and he did. But then when he sinned, he fell, that authority was switched over to the devil. And he has a lease on this earth for a while, but there's coming a time where he's going to be locked up and thrown into the lake of fire. Amen. But while we're alive, we're going to make sure that he knows his place, and that's under, his, under our feet. Amen. Let's, uh, so before we start talking about our authority, I want to establish a few things about God. Okay, because the, the authority is only as good as the power it represents. Let me say that again. Your authority is only as good as the power that it represents. So let's talk about God here for a few moments. And I can't, I can't put God in a box. I can't even come close to describing how awesome and how big he is. But let's just pick a couple of scriptures here just to lay a foundation and, and establish some things about him. Go to Job 26 and verse 7. In fact, um, let's just read this from, um, let's read it from the Amplified. I was going to read from King James, but... He it is who spreads out the northern skies over emptiness and hangs the earth upon or over nothing. Next. He bindeth up the waters in his thick clouds, and the cloud is not rent under them. He holdeth back the face of his throne and spreadeth his cloud upon it. He hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit he hath garnished the heavens. His hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo, these are parts of his ways, but how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Just stop there. 
Who can understand? Nobody can understand. How do you put God in words? You can't, you can't, ex- once you try to explain who God is, he's much, he's like a billion times bigger than that. Think about how he created the, the, the earth, how he created the, the worlds, the, the universe. The universe, the scientists are saying that it's still expanding. He spoke and then it happened and it keeps happening. The speed of light. Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 12 to 13 says, he hath made the earth by his power, he hath established the world by his wisdom, he hath stretched out the heavens by his discretion. When he uttereth his voice, there is a multitude of waters in the heavens, and he hath caused vapors to ascend from the ends of the earth, he maketh lightnings with rain, and bringeth forth the wind out of his treasures. Hallelujah. Psalm 30, verse 4. Turn to Psalm 30. Put this in the Amplified, if you would. Psalm 30, verse 4. Sing to the Lord, O you saints of his, and give thanks to the remembrance of his holy name. Next verse. For his anger is but for a moment, but his favor is for a lifetime, or in his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. As for me and my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. By your favor, O Lord, you have established me as a strong mountain. You hid your face, and I was troubled. I cried to you, O Lord, and the Lord made supplication. What profit is there uh, in my blood when I go down to the pit, the grave? Will the dust praise you? Will I declare your truth and faithfulness to men? Hear, O Lord, have mercy and grace. be gracious to me, O Lord. Be my helper. Uh, let, me, let me go there myself here because I'm, I'm jumping around. Uh, in Psalm chapter 30 and verse 4. Let me go back there. Psalm 30. Okay, I marked down the wrong, the wrong scripture. Uh, well, it's not the wrong, it's all the right scripture, but um, I think it's uh, 30. Yeah, we'll go back to it next time. So God, just understand this. God is ultimate authority. All authority comes from him. All authority. Every authority that we experience is delegated authority that comes from God. There is no higher authority than God, period. Establish that. The the devil doesn't have just as much authority as him. He's a created being. He's under him, right? He created him for his glory, and then he turned on him. He turned on God and then took a third of the angels with him. But he was a created being. There is nothing above God. He has no beginning. He has no end. He's omnipresent. He's omniscient, and he's omnipotent. He's everywhere. He's all-knowing, and he's all-powerful. He's everywhere. God is everywhere. We say, well, I don't see God. He's omnipresent. Now, there's a difference between the omnipresence of God and the manifest presence of God. Omnipresence means God, but he doesn't always manifest himself in a way where you see signs, wonders, miracles. You know, some people have seen him appear before them. Uh, You know, when God comes and he actually manifests himself in the in our physical realm. Okay, that's, that's different. But God is everywhere. You can't hide from God. He is everywhere. He's all-powerful, and he's all-knowing. There's nothing that anyone knows, including the devil, that's more than what God knows. Amen. Period. Let's establish that fact. And I think everybody believes that, but yet we believe that. We say yes, but then when we start getting out into life, we start giving the devil more authority than he really has. God has nothing to prove. He doesn't have to prove anything to us. Why does he have to prove it? He's God. You, he created you. So why does he have to, oh, if you're real, God, show me. Prove, prove to me you're real. Why do I need to prove to you? For what? Oh, I proved it to him. <laughs> now he believes in me. God doesn't owe us a thing. Oh, God owes me. He doesn't owe you anything. He created you. He sent his very best. He sent Jesus to die for you. What more do you want from him? He he sent his best. What more does God owe you? The fact is, is that he didn't owe us anything. We're the ones that turned our back on him. We're the ones that sinned and fell away from God. Right? 
But God in his mercy, because of his love, that scripture, John 3 says, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, whoever believes shall not perish but have everlasting life. It's because of his love and his mercy that he chose to love us in the middle of our sin. So God doesn't owe us one thing. Anything God, now he has promises. Out of his love, he gave us promises in his word that we can hold him to because God is a God of his word. He never backs down on his promises. But if you have the attitude, oh, God owes me something, pfft, you didn't owe you one thing. Now, if you, you change your heart and you say, God, you know, I want to follow you. I, I'm going to start believing your word. I'm going to, you know, I believe your, he's going to start moving in your life. That's when God moves in your life is when you lean in and you draw near. All right? People are saying, well, God hasn't drawn near. What do you call sending his very best to the earth? How much more near do you want God to be for you that you were on your way to hell and he sent his very best to redeem you back to him. Amen. So, but the good thing is that God wants to bless you and he wants to give you the desires of, his, of your heart. If your heart's right, you can see God move mightily in your life. The devil is not omnipresent. He's not everywhere. And he's not all-knowing. He's not omniscient. He knows some stuff and is perverted. I don't, even, I don't even think he understands everything. He doesn't, because he's the father of lies, so I think a lot of the lies that he says and believes, well, he actually believes his own lies. All of the truth that, that the devil says is twisted, deceptive truth. And deceptive truth is a lie. So when, he's, when, when we have words that come against us that say, you, look at you, look what you did. Yes, that, that did. so you're just a nobody. Okay, well, uh, that's not true. Uh, that, there's a par partial truth mixed with lies is all lie. And he's the father of lies. So he knows stuff, and I think he believes a lot of his lies. And, and, he, and when you know your authority over him, he, he, you're always one step. You can be one step of, ahead of the devil or 10 steps. You can always be a step. Just like that time when we did the outreach in, in um, we talked about how the devil won't give you a free run up the side, right? We knew that we were going to go. We had permission, and then someone tried to hijack the permission, some of the up, up people that were kind of tied in with the whole cabal out here, um, that, you know, the... We're going to keep this place the way we want it. You know, we don't want anybody coming and do religious stuff. And, and um, so we were there legally, and we preached the gospel. And we knew. I was just waiting for the, the, the devil to try to stick his ugly head up. But we prayed. We believed God. And we started, and we, pre we gave away toys. We had games. Kids were having fun. For, uh, and it was very cold that day, wasn't it? There was a, a lot of people were, you know. But I would say 80% of the crowd came forward and got saved. And meanwhile, the guy was trying to unplug. That stinking devil tried to stop, but he couldn't stop. And people got saved that day because we obeyed God. We were a step ahead of the devil. And that's how the devil, he, you think, well, I, I say you, people think that the devil is one step of them, ahead of them because they think he's all knowing. He, he doesn't, listen, he doesn't even know we're talking right now. Because he's busy doing other things around the world. He's not omnipresent. He doesn't know everything that you're saying. Now, there's devils out there, you know, but they, they're clueless. They're totally clueless. Understand that God is all-powerful. And if, he, if God be for us, who can be against us? Tell me, who can be against us? Oh, what the devil's doing this, the devil's doing that. Wait a minute. Who... Why don't you turn that around on him? Why don't you wreak havoc on the devil? Why don't you go win some souls? Why don't you go take some ground? You can, you can give the devil hell. <laughs> How do you give the devil hell? You ignore him, right? Put him in his place and move forward with your life and live fearlessly and take your authority over him. And then when, and he'll test you to see if you know your authority. And when you start holding on to that authority, he'll just leave you alone. Oh, well, man, leave that guy alone. And he'll try to come back and test you again. But you talk about the life of faith. We are not here because we're afraid of the devil. 
We did not buy a property after being a year, only one year old because we were afraid of the devil. There were a lot of voices. Yeah, you don't want to do this. You don't want to do that. We, we obey God. I don't care what, the, I don't care what the, the numbers say. We believe God and we move forward and we see God move. And that's the life of faith. And we're learning. I'm not saying we're, we've arrived, but we're getting there. Amen. And we're getting there together. Amen. How many here want to occupy and move forward and see your life count and be effective? Hallelujah. So th the devil is confined to earth with limited knowledge and power. Limited knowledge and power. There's a lot of wrong teaching uh, that has been uh, circling the church concerning the devil, concerning spiritual warfare. And how do, you, how do you know? Well, we go by what the Bible says. Amen. Let me ask you a question. Which covenant, which covenant are you living under? We have two covenants. We have the old covenant and we have the new covenant. Right? Which one are you living under? Now, some people are not living under any. They're just clueless. They don't even know. And that's, you know, now if you've been in church for 30 years, that's your own fault that you're clueless. Um, if you're a brand new Christian, that's okay. But there are people that love, that just love the Old Testament, man. And we, we need the full counsel of God. Understand that the Old Testament, it, it all points to the new. It's, it's, it, we, we should be looking for Jesus in every single book of the Old Testament. But see, people love to get stuck there. And they forget about the finished work of the cross. So they get in the Old Testament and they, and they, they, they love all, the, all the, you know, the rituals and all that. And, uh, you know, I won't, I'll pick, let's pick on, I won't pick on him because he was in Old Testament. Look at Daniel. Daniel chapter 10, we won't go there. He had, he had to pray 21 days to get his answer, right? 21 days. Old covenant. Now, we're in the new covenant. We can come boldly to his throne of grace in the time of need. Anytime we need him, he's right there. We don't have to wait for God to intervene. I've got to wait 21 days before God's going to answer my prayer. He, can, he is the God of the suddenness. He will come and touch you right now if you need him. If you need a miracle, he'll come touch you right now. That's new covenant. Boldly come boldly to his throne. But see, some people like to stay in the old. Some people like a little bit of the old and the new. And so what they do is they take a little bit of the old, they put a little bit of the new, they make their own covenant. So one day they're, or one moment they're in victory, you know, living in freedom and victory, and then the next moment they're living in defeat. Up and down, confused, confused, like, which covenant am I in? I need to create my own covenant. But we are in a new covenant with better promises. Let me ask you a question. When Jesus said it is finished, what did he mean? He meant it is finished. Everything that the old covenant was, you know, when, when the blood of the lamb was put on the doorpost, right? The, um, the children of Israel, when the death angel was coming in Egypt, and they put the blood, blood of the lamb, they put the hyssop in the blood, and they had to slaughter lamb. It's, a, it's amazing. I don't see people today slaughtering lambs. It's in the Old Testament. Might as, might as well just slaughter lambs too. Well, they were slaughtering, but they're putting the blood on the doorposts. But that was because they were looking to the cross. That was a type and shadow of Jesus going to the, the finished work. Because their faith was in the finished work of the cross, the death angel passed them by. But if their faith was not in the finished work of the cross, it would have just been blood of. It would have just been nothing. But see, we in the new covenant, we look back to the cross. In the old, they look too. One day our Savior's going to come. One day the Messiah is going to come. In the meantime, we've got to butcher, you know, bulls and goats and pigeons and do all this stuff and keep the law. And it's like impossible to keep the entire law. That's why Jesus came and paid the price and finished. And he gave us all authority. Amen. Hallelujah. People don't know their authority. They don't have a revelation of the finished work of the cross. We are under the new covenant. Remember, always remember that we are under. If, there's any, if you have to pick a covenant to study, 
Spend time in the old covenant. R read in it, but always end up in the new. Start in the old and end in the new. If you find something that's confusing in the Old Testament, just say, what, is, what does the Bible say about it in the New Testament? What did, what did the Apostle Paul say? What did he say in his epistles? What did, you know, what did, when after Jesus was raised from the dead, he said, it is finished, and he's, he's seated at the right hand of the Father. What, what does the Bible say after that part? I tell you, if people start living that way and start looking at the new, spending most of their time in the new, they're going to find some major revelation of who they are in Christ and who God is and that we are on the winning side. If God be for us, who in the world? Who do you, who do you think you are, man? Coming to try to attack the child of God? I'm private property. I'm God's property. Yeah, but people don't talk, oh, the devil, you know, the devil did. No, man. He'll, he'll test you. He'll see if you believe it. But you put your foot down. This is not okay. This is, you, you're going to rue the day that you've tried to attack my family, tried to attack, attack my business, tried to attack my church or my loved ones. We've got to take our authority. I'm going to share a couple more scriptures here. Out of all the letters written in the ch to the churches, um, all the epistles, if you read in the, in the New Testament, because there's two-thirds of the, New Te or the epistles were written by Apostle Paul. Well, he writ wrote nearly two-thirds of the New Testament. But out of all the, the, the letters that were written, there's one letter in particular that best describes our authority through the finished work of the cross. And that's the book of Ephesians. And I want you to turn here to Ephesians chapter 1, and I know we go there. Um, we refer back to this, but this is kind of our text. I'm going I'm to share this, and we're going to close. So I want you to go to Ephesians chapter 1, and then tonight we're going to see what the Lord does. Amen. I love just... Seeing what the Lord does. Let's do this in the Amplified. Verse 17. For I, I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory. Now understand, Apostle Paul had an encounter with Jesus on the road to Damascus. He had an, This is after Jesus rose from the... This is at New Covenant... And he was persecuting the church. He had an encounter with him that you can't put in words. As articulate as the Apostle Paul, as educated as, as Apostle Paul was, he could not articulate this. So this is something he had to pray for people to get a revelation of. So he says, I, I always pray to the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, that he may grant you a spirit of wisdom and revelation of insight into the mysteries and secrets and the deep and intimate knowledge of him. Stay right there. Go back. Of insight into the mist. So there's mysteries and secrets. What does that mean? That means that there's things that people don't know about, about God. But he prays that we would understand these things, that we would have a revelation of these. If there was a mystery that I have a, a chance to be able to know, I think I want to find that out, right? But see, a lot of people are ignorant or they're, un, and they're unknowledgeable about what's available to them. But it says the revelation of the insight into the mysteries and secrets in the deep and intimate knowledge of him. Next verse. By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know, understand that the Apostle Paul was talking to the Ephesian church. He's talking to not just the Ephesian church, but it's for the church, all churches, and to this church and to the universal church. So he's talking to people of God. So obviously, there are certain people that didn't have their, the eyes of their heart flooded with light yet. So there's a, there's a place in God that we need to arrive at where our eyes, the eyes of our heart are flooded with light. By having the eyes of your heart flooded with light so that you can know, so that you can know and understand the hope to which he has called you and how rich is his glorious inheritance in the saints, his set apart ones. Verse 19. And so that you can know and understand what is the immeasurable and unlimited and surpassing greatness of what? His power. 
oh, well, this is just spiritual power. No, all power. Of his power in and for us who believe. Not just anybody, but those who believe. That power is available to those who believe. People that don't believe, they're not going to experience that power. In and for us who believe as demonstrated in the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ, his might. What kind of strength? God's mighty strength. He's all powerful, right? We just established that fact. God is all powerful, which he exerted, his power, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him in his own right hand in heavenly places. We're talking about resurrection power. Resurrection. There's no power that's greater than resurrection power. Which he exerted in Christ. Go, uh, did we just read that? Verse 20. Right hand in heaven. Which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead, seated in his own right hand in heavenly places, far above all rule and authority. Wait a minute. Some or all? All rule. Yeah, but the devil. No, no. All all, okay, well, we're, we're talking about Jesus, though. Yeah, you know, obviously Jesus, you know. Far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every name that is named above every title that can be conferred, not only in this age and in this world, but also in the age and the world which are to come. And he has put all things under his feet and appointed him the universal and supreme head of the church, a headship exercised throughout the church, which is his body, the fullness of him. Who's the body? We are the body. We are the body of Christ. The fullness of him who fills all in all, for in that body lives the full measure of him who makes everything complete and who fills everything everywhere with himself. Hallelujah. Now go on to, uh, we'll, we'll go on to the next chapter, verses 1 through 9. And you he made alive when you were dead slain by your trespasses and sin, in which at one time you walked habitually, you were following the course in the fashion of this world, where under the sway of the tendency of this present age, following the prince of the power of the air, you were obedient to and under the control of the demon spirit that still constantly works in the sons of disobedience, the careless, the rebellious, and the unbelieving who go against the purposes of God. Among these, we, as well as you, once lived and conducted yourselves in the passions of our flesh and our behavior governed by our corrupt and sensual nature, obeying the impulses in the flesh and the thoughts in the mind of our cravings dictated by our senses and our dark imaginings. We were then, by nature, the children of God's wrath and heirs of his indignation like the rest of mankind, which is before the cross, before we got saved. But God, so rich in his mercy, because of and in order to satisfy Satisfy the great and wonderful intense love which he, with which he loved us, even when we were dead, slain by our own shortcomings and trespasses. He made us alive in the deadness. He made us alive together in fellowship and in union with Christ. He gave us the very life of Christ himself, the same new life with which he quickened him. What, what did he quicken with? With the, po the mighty power that resurrected. He quickened him. For it is by grace, his favor and mercy, which you did not deserve, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation. Just a couple more verses. And he raised us up together. Okay, right here. We're the, if he's the head of the church, we are the body, and Jesus was raised from the dead, and he sat at the right hand of the Father, and we are his body, where do you think the body is? He raised us up together with him, okay, and made us sit down together, giving us joint seating with him in the heavenly sphere, sphere by virtue of, being, of our being in Christ Jesus, the Messiah, the anointed one. He did this that he might clearly demonstrate through the ages to come the immeasurable, li measurable, limitless, surpassing riches of this free grace, his unmerited favor, his kindness and goodness of heart towards us in Christ Jesus. Two more verses. For it is by free grace, God's unmerited favor, that you are saved, delivered from judgment, and made partakers of Christ's salvation through your faith. And this salvation is not of yourselves, of your own doing. 
It came not through your own striving, but it is the gift of God. Not because of works, not the fulfillment of the law's demands, lest any man should boast. It is not the result of what anyone can possibly do so that no one can pride himself in it or take glory to himself. So it's not by works we're saved, but it's by grace. It's because of the love of God. But the Bible says that we've been raised up together with him. And if we just read in uh, Ephesians chapter 1 that all things are under his feet, right? Can you get any higher than the throne of God, the right hand of the throne? You can't get any higher than that. And if all things are under his feet, and we are seated with him because we're attached, the body's attached. Is your body attached to your head? Yes. My body is. I mean, you wouldn't be able, to be able to survive without a head, right? So you're connected, your body, the body of Christ, us collectively, in individually, we are connected to the head. So if the head is up there, guess where the body is? Up there too. Verse 6, go back to verse 6. While we wait. And he raised us up together. There, period. There it is. We don't even have to explain how the body is attached to the head. It just says it right there. And he raised us up together with him and made us sit down together. So if we're seated together with Christ in heavenly places, then that means all things are under our feet. Oh, but what about the devil in the heavenlies? He, you know, he's over this territory. Where is that territory? Under our feet. I don't care what territory he has, a th what he calls authority over. The fact is, he's still under our feet. Period. So we, once the church stops giving the devil all this credit, and we start to realize, hey, <laughs> wait a minute here. You're under my feet, but I'm letting you do this to me? Something's wrong with this picture. And see, the devil loves to deceive people and keep people in ignorance because if he can keep you ignorant, he's got you right where he wants you because the only authority you have is the authority that you understand, the authority that you know that is given to you. But the church doesn't know this because it's not being taught. It's not being taught. It is being taught, but it's not being taught in many places. I'd like to say I've been to churches all over the world and it's not being taught a lot. But things are changing. Amen. And I'm going to stop right there. And we'll, we'll resume a little bit tonight and then next week. So for the next couple of weeks, we're going to start digging into this authority thing. How many, how many feel like God's starting to unveil a couple things to you this morning? It's a good, good time to teach. Sometimes it's good to teach. Sometimes it's good to preach. And ultimately, follow the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Lord, I thank you that you're giving us a revelation of who Christ is and who we are in Christ and who Christ is in us. Lord, I thank you that the eyes of our understanding are being enlightened. And I thank you, Lord, that we're seeing you as you really are. And Lord, I pray that, that not one pers person in this place would live the rest of their life ineffective. They may have kind of taking a break, taking a back seat. But Lord, no more. We're not taking a back seat anymore. We're not just going to play church. We're not just going to show up and watch and listen and take notes and just sit back and get, get full of information. Lord, we are, you called us. You brought us into the kingdom for such a time as this. You handpicked us to live in this generation, to make a difference and to be effective for the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, I, I pray for every individual in this place. I pray that you would, you would just uh, expand their, their, their mindset. I pray that they begin to think the way you think, to think big, to believe you for big things because you're a big God. I thank you, Lord, that there are no limits. There are absolute, because you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think. And so, Lord, we take the limitations off this morning, and we say, Lord, we trust you. And we, we align ourselves with your word. We align ourselves with what you want us to do 
in this life. Lord, we don't understand everything yet, but I believe that your Holy Spirit, our teacher, is teaching us and, and helping us. And so, Lord, I thank you for the truths that were, that were uh, spoken today. And I thank you that the word of God never returns void, but always goes forth and accomplishes that which it was sent out to do. And so, Lord, I thank you that as every person leaves here this morning, they're, they're gonna, that this truth of their authority is starting to sink in more and more in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Now, if you're in this place, I, I, I always like to make a, a, a give an opportunity. If you're in this place and you say, you know, I don't know. You talk about authority. I, you know, I, I don't know. If, I don't even know if I'm going to heaven. I, I, didn't, I don't know if, if this was my last day alive, if I'd spend eternity with Jesus. And, uh, you know, this authority thing, it means nothing if you don't know Jesus. And um, if you don't know for sure, you know, today's your day. The Bible says that today is a day of salvation. We've all sinned. Not one of us was perfect or is perfect. We've all sinned. The Bible says that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus. The gift of God. He, God so loved the world that he gave his best for you he came he made the first step he took the first step to you now the ball's in your court will you come to him he's calling your name if you're in this place you don't know Jesus or maybe you're in this place and you've given your heart to the Lord and days gone by and you, you you've kind of drifted away because of whatever maybe there was a, a, a sudden uh, thing that happened in your life whether it be a divorce or whether it be a a, a deal gone bad a betrayal of a friend uh, loss of a job, loss of a loved one, something that caused you to question God. And let me tell you, there's a devil that hates your soul, and he's the, he is the thief. He's come to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said he has come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus is the author of life. The devil is, is the author of death and destruction. Anything evil, anything that's destructive, that takes life away, that doesn't come from God. He is the author of life. And he loves you and you're dear to him. And he's not angry with you. He poured out all of his anger and his wrath on Jesus when he stood in our place on that cross. And he was in that moment, he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God had to turn his back on Jesus because he poured all of his wrath on sin and had to destroy sin right there on the cross. So God is not angry at you. He was angry at sin and he dealt with sin. But if you come to him as you are today, he will pour out his mercy on you and welcome you into the family. If that's you in this place and you say, I, you know, I don't know. I don't know if I'm going to spend eternity with Jesus. I want to make him my Lord today, whether it's your first time or you never, or you're coming back to him. If that's you, I want you to slip your hand up. Just be bold. Be bold. We're talking about living a fearless life. If you can't lift your hand here and you know God's speaking to you, you know, this is where it starts, from the family of God. We've all had to make this decision. If that's you, just lift your hand up high to heaven. I'll pray for you. Okay. Always want to make that opportunity. Uh, last last week, was it last week or the week before, we had some people come forward and give their heart to the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, how many ready to live life? They're not going to be moved by negative news. We're going to move forward. Hallelujah. And we're going to take, as we do every Sunday, I'm not going to go into a long teaching here, but we take communion every Sunday. And... Uh, because we believe in the power of communion. We believe in the point of contact where we can release our faith. In this day and age, we need to walk in supernatural health. Amen? And how, how many believe that, that there is power in the table of the Lord when we mix faith with it? Amen? I'll take one of those. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. So we're doing this because we believe everybody here is saved. You're on your way to heaven. And um, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.
You know, especially in times where we're taking communion, this is holy. This is not a time to go, hey, it's time to go to the buffet line. I know we went a little longer than what, but if anything, if you didn't get one thing right here, this is, this is the time to honor the Lord. Amen. Lord, we just thank you for your body that was broken for us. We don't take it lightly. We don't take it. Thank you. Thank you for your body that was broken for us. Thank you, Lord. How many know God's not moved by sounds? Lord, we just thank you. Thank you, Lord, for, for allowing yourself to suffer for us so that we could be healed. We could walk in wholeness. You suffered spirit, soul, and body. You suffered spiritually so we could have eternal life. You suffered mentally so we could have soundness of mind and physically so we could be whole in our body. Thank you. And Lord, we thank you that the power of the table of the Lord is still strong today. And we put our faith in the finished work of the cross. Lord, we thank you that by your stripes we were healed. So right now, by faith, we receive healing in our body, and we thank you for submitting yourself to be beaten in that way for us so we can have wholeness, spirit, soul, and body. So we receive, if you need healing in your body, if you need soundness in your mind, if you, whatever you need, physically, mentally, emotionally, you receive that right now by faith as we take together. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for this cup. It's your blood. And that blood washes us clean, makes us new. It's only because of your blood that we are new creatures in Christ Jesus. We are in right standing with you because of your blood. The spotless Lamb of God shed his blood for us. It's by your blood that we are saved. It's by your blood that we are restored back to the Father, that we have a relationship with him. Thank you for shedding your blood for us. And we thank you, Lord, that your blood also protects us, just like the children of Israel were protected by the death angel. Lord, we thank you for the blood of Jesus. It covers us, it covers our family, and we declare that no death or destruction will come near our family and our homes. And we make that declaration today. In Jesus' name, we thank you for it. Let's take it together. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise the Lord. Well, are you happy? How many ready to take up some authority this week? Put the, put the devil in his place. Amen. Let me pray for you. Father, I thank you for this church and every member, every visitor. I pray that you would reveal yourself to them this week. Move in their life. Go before them. Be, be about them like a wall of fire. Thank you, Lord, for your favor that goes before them. We thank you that this week will be a week of favor and blessings and miracles. And we declare that. And we thank you for it in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you all. We love you dearly. And uh, thank you for being hungry enough to stick through the whole service. Love you so much. Have a great afternoon. Don't forget tonight, 6 o'clock. Bless you.